Hello, my little darklings. This is a special episode, one where we examine the curious case of Bishop Pike. This was a friend and a case file from Dr. Hans Holzer. My special guest for this episode, Mark Anthony. We dive deep into this very unusual story. That's next, right here on the best in paranormal podcasting. This is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. The Curious Case of Bishop Pike. This comes from the case files of Dr. Hans Holzer, The Psychic World of Bishop Pike. This gentleman, Bishop Pike, what a remarkable guy. We're going to find out a lot about him. If you are not familiar, you guys are in for a treat tonight. Uh, uh, Hans Holzer was a very good friend of Bishop Pike's and wrote kind of what is considered to be the book about uh, Bishop Pike's life, his death, and the strange aftermath of this case. But when I wanted to set forward and do this episode, um, there's not many of the original authors around, nobody that was uh, available to talk to me about this. So again, I set out one of the best researchers I know. He is a, a fan of the paranormal, a researcher himself. And when I started talking to him about Bishop Pike, he knew who it was and was happy to dive in headlong to get into this. So I want to make sure I get all of the proper accolades in place. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us tonight, Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, psychic explorer, is a fourth generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's an Oxford educated attorney licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, DC, and before the United States Supreme Court. The media dubbed him the psychic explorer because he travels to mystical locations in remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. Mark has appeared nationwide on TV and radio, including CBS TV's The Doctors, Gaia TV's Beyond Belief with George Norrie. He's the co-host of The Psychic and The Doc on the Transformation Network, and he is a featured speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, which include Brown, Columbia, Harvard, and Yale. Mark Anthony is a columnist for Best Holistic Life magazine and the best-selling author of Never Letting Go and Evidence of Eternity, his highly anticipated cutting-edge new book, The Afterlife Frequency. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome back one of our all-time favorite guests and one of yours, the one, the only Mark Anthony. Hello, Mark. Hey, Dave. Thank you for having me on. Now, how familiar were you with Bishop Pike before I, I asked you to do a deep dive into the story? Well, it's really hard if you study theology, philosophy, and psychic phenomenon like, like I'd have my whole life not to be aware of Bishop Pike. And I'll tell you, Dave, I mean, he's got to be one of the most interesting and controversial characters in theology, certainly in the 20th century, and even his influence exists to this day. There's still backlash. I mean, I even found articles written as recently as 2018 where they're still reviewing him. In fact, I think it was, um, uh, there was a Catholic uh, newspaper um, that called him, they, they do an article called the heretic of the week. And they actually <laughs> wrote an article about uh, Bishop Pike um, as their heretic of the week. And, and so what he did and what he said lives long after his, his physical life. So, right. uh, yeah, and, you know, we could spend just an entire episode talking about the man's credentials. I mean, he graduated from several different uh, colleges, University of Santa Clara, UCLA, uh, University of Southern California, Yale University, he got a law degree, and not just a law degree, but a JSD, which is a fairly rare degree. It's the equivalent of a PhD in law, which yeah. focuses mostly on research. And then he even went to the Union Theological Seminary. So he started his education in 1930 and didn't get his last degree until 1951. So as a young man in, in the 50s, he had a lot of degrees. 
So uh, he's, he's a smart guy. I want to mention something just going forward, folks. We are going to be talking about a religious leader, and uh, Bishop Pike is that. I, I We're going to say a lot of different things tonight uh, in regards to Bishop Pike and church. Uh, this this is in no way means uh, as a slap against any of the different religions right. or belief systems. But I'm going to go on record as saying after the research and reading and interviews that do exist with Bishop Pike online that you can find and the, the multitude of, of little bios that they did on Bishop Pike, this guy was controversial for a good reason. You know, this was the 50s and 60s, and he was at the forefront of the civil rights movement. He, he was part of that march with Dr. Martin Luther King. He didn't sit on the sidelines. He engaged because he believed in the gay rights um, assignments back in the 60s and 50s. He believed in human rights and religious uh, ability to believe what you want to believe and not be chastised. And and I found that so refreshing as, I, as I've been reading about him myself. This guy was a thinker. And I love the fact that in a lot of these little interviews that you'll see that he pops up on and live on YouTube and places like that, when they talk to the other uh, religious leaders that were part of his church, it's funny because they're all like, listen, you know, the guy was either a complete madman or he was a complete genius. And I'm pretty sure his genius is what made him seem insane. And the only reason he pissed all of us off was because he was asking the questions none of us could answer. And he had answers none of us had ever thought of. And that's what I love about religion and spirituality is challenging the paradigm, not in an egotistical way. There are many people who said that Bishop Pike became self-absorbed in his own ego, but I think it was because he was seeing the inadequacies of religious structure, not of spirituality, not of communing with God and, and Christ and, and whatever religious leader you believed in, but in the way that the edicts were put down, the theologies and dogmas of the church. He, he did. And, you know, Dave, he did something else, which I found really fascinating. We've all heard of Senator Joseph McCarthy back in the 1950s um, during the, the intensity of the Cold War. There was a senator, uh, Joseph McCarthy, and he formed the House, uh, excuse me, the Senate Committee on Un-American Activities. And McCarthy spearheaded investigations on all, all types of people. Um, Hollywood was decimated. Uh, there's a movie, Trumbo, um, which stars, um, who's the guy that played William White? Uh, Brian Cranston, yeah, fantastic. Brian. Uh, yeah, highly recommend it. Um, I mean, I remember years and years and years ago, there was a movie, The Way We Were, it was all about the McCarthy hearings. And McCarthy was destroying a lot of people's lives because um, they were investigating anyone, even people who went to socialist or communist party meetings been in the 1930s, just going to a meeting to listen to it. They were then charged with being a communist. Um, the pressure he did uh, even made Charlie Chaplin leave the United States. Well, Bishop Pike went public against him because McCarthy was trying to accuse uh, nearly 700 ministers, pastors throughout the country as being communists when Pike was fearless. And he stood up against him. And then President Eisenhower jumped on the Pike bandwagon. And because of Bishop Pike's attacks, counterattacks on Joseph McCarthy, that began his decline and fall. So it's really hard to just encapsulate what this man did. And like you brought out, Dave, and, and I want to say this too, we're going to be talking about some theological issues that he brought up that some people are going to find offensive. This does not represent, you know, me, uh, Mark Anthony, but he, he rose very quickly in the Pis Episcopalian church. Initially, Dave, he started out as a Roman Catholic. But then he went through a period of questioning his faith and became an agnostic, which means he didn't really believe in God, but he would accept evidence. And then he decided to go to the Episcopalian Church, which, you know, I was raised in the Catholic faith. And, and we always joke that Episcopalian is like diet Catholic. OK, you know, because a lot of the, the procedures, the rituals are the same, but they don't acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the pope. Uh, all instead, the, all yeah. the guilt, but one third the calories. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same great spirituality, less That's guilt. Right. And, and so but um, he actually became the bishop of California uh, in the Episcopalian Church, which is quite quite a, a very big deal. But he he wrote 50 books. He questioned 
the existence, well, I didn't question it. He said the Trinity is mythology, the virgin birth is mythology, and hell is mythology. And whoa, did that receive backlash, not just from the Episcopalians, but from every Christian denomination, which is why he is often called the apostate priest. An apostate is considered to be a traitor or in the religious sense, somebody who completely rebukes and rejects. Other people, other analysts call him an iconoclast. An iconoclast is one of those dollar 25 cent words. <laughs> and an iconoclast is someone who directly challenges traditionally held beliefs. And from the analysis that I've done of Bishop Pike, he looked at Christianity as something that we need to embrace the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a minister. It's the love, the peace, the understanding, the forgiveness. It was the true spirit of the scriptures, not a believe what we tell you and don't question it because if you do, then you go to hell. And so in that respect, that type of thinking was very revolutionary in the 1950s and 60s. But you know, Dave, he was also a child of his times because it was the 1960s where students began to protest against the Vietnam War. There was the love movement, rock and roll. Um, traditional institutions were shaken to their very core by all these new beliefs. And Bishop Pike was at the, the head, head of the pack when it came to religion. And what was great, trust me, folks, there's psychic revelations, ghostly stories, and a lot of the paranormal, obviously, that's why Dr. Holzer got involved and, and wrote the book, The Psychic World of Bishop Pike. We're going to get into that. But in order to discuss his his life, we have to discuss um, all of it and talk about where he came from, why his life took some strange turns. And the fact that he stood up, which I think is very brave as a religious leader, not denouncing the church, not denouncing the religion or the positive aspects of it, but denouncing some of the, listen, we're coming into a new age, which I think is why people in the 20 and 21st century have strayed away, because it does seem like we're talking about fables and folklore more. Instead of teaching about the meaning it, it's sometimes more in the esoteric and mythological aspects of this. And he saw that 40, 50 years ago and realized in order to keep on top of this wave, we need to contemporize, not devalue, but contemporize what we're discussing and what these mean to all of us. And that was, that was very powerful, which I think is what spoke to Dr. Holzer as well. This man's conviction to every aspect of what he did. And this guy, again, Aside from being out on the forefront for gay rights and uh, civil rights, he was against the war. He was out on Haight Ashbury with the hippies and not chastising or you know yelling at. The, he was there supporting the love movement, supporting the concept of what they were trying to achieve. Which I, that speaks volumes about what real spirituality is and why he might be connected in such a, a big way to. A, a much wider world than most spiritual leaders would be considered to uh, to be a part of. Well, on the flip side of the karmic coin, he also had a very colorful personal life. And I mean, he, he was a womanizer. He battled alcoholism, he was a heavy chain smoker. Um, you know, and the joke I always uh, have heard is smoking doesn't send you to hell. It just makes you smell like you've been there. Right. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, he, he was married to Jane Alves in 1938, divorced her in 1941. 1942, married Esther Yanofsky, divorced her in 1965. But when he was married to Esther Yanofsky, he was living with his secretary, Mayan Hackett Bergren. And there's a lot of controversy what was going on there. Not only was he living with his secretary, but apparently she overdosed on sleeping pills in his apartment. And according to police reports, he moved her body down the hall to her room, destroyed evidence, lied to the police, and yet performed her eulogy at her memorial. 
So this was leaking out into the Episcopalian Church. And then in 1968, he married Diane Kennedy, who was one of his students. She was also 24 years younger than him. So he had this, you know, very checkered personal life. And, you know, come on, you, you can't always uh, trash somebody for having difficult personal relationships. But the whole episode with Mayan Hackett Bergrud was very suspicious. That, that didn't bode well with a lot of people. But you know, Dave, if he did have a soulmate in this life, it was Diane Kennedy. And Diane Kennedy is not only still alive, but she is an ordained priest in the Episcopalian religion, and she's active. So she's got to be, gosh, she's got to be in her late 70s or 80s by now. So she's still going, and she turned an organization into the Bishop Pike Foundation, which then merged with the Love Foundation, and it still exists now. And it's for helping uh, youth uh, find themselves and their leadership abilities. So the good aspects of his life continue. But where things start getting mystical, and I know this is what you want to talk to, and for those of us, um, all right, certainly for people who, who watch the Holzer Files, for people who are familiar with my work, when somebody you love dies, it's very devastating. And this happened to Bishop Pike. Even though he was already a very spiritual man, his 20-year-old son took a gun to his head. It was in New York City. And Bishop Pike, they'd had an off-and-on relationship, but toward the end of his son's life, they had been able to reunite and his son died by suicide and Bishop Pike was in London at the time. I believe actually he was in Cambridge. He was over in the UK, obviously devastated. His his son dies. Right. But, but then strange things begin to happen. I've got to I've got to think, you know, it's one thing for the lay person to lose somebody. But when you're a religious leader whose yeah. son not only dies, which is devastating and, and tragic in its own, but took his own life, that has got to put you into a very interesting position theologically, religiously, mentally. How do you, as a leader, keep pushing forward and still maintain class and style through all of that? And that I can't even imagine what he must have been going through, especially knowing that they had been estranged for so long and, and they were finally on the road to recovery. And then he had to go off to, to do some work and his, uh, his son took his own life. It, it was absolutely crushing for him. And strange things, according to uh, his book, The Other Side, which we are talking about, he started noticing in his apartment, like postcards arranged in this, this shape. Then he noticed safety pins and bent in the same position. And he started seeing all these things in the same position. And then he looked at a clock that had stopped working and it was 819. And then he looked at the postcards, he looked at the safety pins all over his apartment. There were things in this shape, the shape of 819. And then it dawned on him, that was the time when his son took his life. So he immediately started sensing that this could be, it's what I call in my work, a frequency beacon. And, and so that's, that then opened a new door, a new facet to Bishop Pike, where he began to turn to psychics to see if he could communicate, get in contact with his son, because it appeared to him that his son was sending these signs. And like, you know, I term this a frequency beacon because I've seen in, 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 in my colleagues who are mediums, uh, how many times have people lost a loved one and then they start you look at a clock and they see like 819 or they hear that one song or they're prompted to turn on the radio and there's that song or they smell the familiar scent but there's no source for it okay this is how this is how spirits do reach out to us and so bishop pike was one of the first people to begin documenting this in a coherent and intelligent manner well, he also, there were some other funnier aspects, right? Like uh, a woman that they knew that had bangs that his son, Jimmy, did not like. She suddenly singed her hair and lost her bangs, right? It was just weird little things. The temperature in the apartment, they would keep it low 
and Bishop Pike would return to see the temperature had been turned back to what Jimmy always set it to. Right. So they would they would just keep running into these instances that they were not alone. I like the fact that he went outside the normal realm. And I wonder how many religious leaders do this, but don't do it as public. It, look for help and look for connection with that other side. Well, I, I can attest to that from firsthand knowledge. A lot of um, members of the clergy have come to me for readings. I've had Catholic priests, Baptist ministers, Episcopalians, Methodists, Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims come to me to make connections with their loved ones in spirit. And it's always fascinating. And I would imagine that uh, Bishop Pike had these type of discussions as well. And I'm like, you know, it says, you know, this, this in the Bible, like mediums are not a god. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, a couple of verses around, you know, uh, eating shellfish is an abomination and, you, you know, it's supposed to um, stone your daughter to death if she walks into a temple menstruating. So they said, you know, you have to take this in perspective. And also the Bible is uh, Old and New Testament is loaded with stories of people with psychic abilities. And when we're the bad guys, we're witches or mediums. And when we're good guys were prophets or prophetesses. A lot of them, and in fact, um, the Catholic priests that, that I've done readings for told me in no uncertain terms, the Vatican is very well aware of psychic phenomena. What do you think the saints were? And the our official statement, and this holds true with the Episcopalians and others, is yeah, you're not supposed to do it. But they also realize that it is a gift and that spirits are capable of communicating with us and if we know how to pay attention to the signs. And so that's why people in the clergy find themselves in this, this paradox, this terrible dilemma when they're crushed by grief and unfortunately um, they don't find scripture comforting. Now, that being said, yeah. You know, it's I interesting don't want too. To, to hurt anybody's feelings, right, right. but, but I've, I've heard this, I don't know, about 4,000 times. Well, I've, I've talked to religious leaders from many different sects and um, from rabbis to priests to pastors to ministers. Uh, and do you, you know what? A lot of them tell me on the slide, they're like, uh, well, I, I can quite often see the spirits at the funeral and or oh, I, yeah. I've, I've spoken to and and done these things. But if I say this out loud, people will A, think I'm nuts or B, think I must be working with the devil when truly what we're given and is given in the in the Bible, Jesus even says that that which I do, so can you if you have belief in, in my father, right? It, these these leaders have what's called discernment right. and gives them this ability. And, and many religious leaders I know are extremely mediumistic and psychic. Not everyone, of course, not everybody. And, and I'm sure some of them fight it back for fear what it could mean. But when most of them are realizing that the, the messages they're getting are love messages, not you should kill your entire you know, congregation with Kool-Aid. I mean, that's when you start to question where you're getting yeah. your information, right? <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say. So that was, you know, that's an interesting element. So he's he is is not necessarily having the communication, but his son's spirit is so strong. And I know people were saying, well, he was just dealing with the grieving process, which is powerful. But other people were witnessing this phenomena around him as well. Correct. And see, he started consulting with um, a number of mediums. Um, Ethel Johnson Myers, who worked with Hans Holzer during the Amityville investigation, and I hold her in very high regard. Ina Twig, um, she's a British medium. From what I understand, the connections that she made with him uh, were very good, a lot of evidence, and also there was some well, fascinating... And let's mention that questions. Ina Twig yeah. was, was really the first medium that he sought counsel with, and in she, Britain, yeah. she made the communication with him the first time, which... She gave a few elements that you know it was somewhat generalized. He was he was he was right a, a, attuned to that. That it, uh, some of it was generalized, but there were just a, enough little bits dropped that were specific to her his son that he knew she couldn't know this. And when he saw her the second time, and she dug deeper and he wanted to understand his son's death more, she said it you know had something to do with his sense of person and yeah 
maybe femininity does this make sense and yeah. bishop pike never talked openly about it but it did make sense to him that his son might be dealing with homosexual feelings or right. made him question and, and feel weak which that really struck home with him and i thought was interesting because her story is equally weird and and kind of cool the way they connect in this but he was seeking this and he was doing it publicly too i thought that was pretty compelling i don't know was it in the sense of harry houdini do i go see these people and see if they're charlatans or do i give this grieving father give these people the opportunity to prove to me that there is something beyond what we all thought we knew well i think a part of what happened with bishop pike is he got so excited when he was working with legitimate mediums and getting evidence because it was a big mystery why Jim Jr., his son, uh, took his own life. But then it came out in Ina's reading about his conflict of uh, being homosexual, which is also fascinating because Bishop Pike then was at the forefront of the gay rights movement, which in the 1960s was about as fringe as it, as it got. Yeah. You know, nowadays it's mainstream. Who doesn't know someone who's gay? I mean, you know, we have Secretary Pete Buttigieg, all right? So, you know, being gay is like no big deal. Um, but back in the 60s, it was. But the other thing about Bishop Pike is he was kind of the first really flashy televangelist because he had a TV show. And then he went beyond what anybody's done. And he had medium Arthur Ford come right. on the show and conduct a seance in other words, Arthur Ford did a reading for him on on television, allegedly, and I'm saying allegedly here because I want to talk about this, get in touch with his son. It was discovered after Arthur Ford's death that in his, his home, there were scrapbooks filled with articles and information about Bishop Pike and his son. Hmm. So the allegation is that Ford was doing research on Bishop Pike and on Jim Jr. prior to the, the readings. I don't know if he did. I don't know if he was collecting that information after the fact to see if what he brought up, you know, ha, you know could be verified right. or it was done before the fact. But I think it's, it's necessary for us to bring this up. And the reason that I do, Dave, is uh, you and I have been working together a long time. And what I've always admired about you is you go with, evidence, okay, before you jump to any conclusions. And that's the mark of a true paranormal investigator is implementing the scientific method, observation before we jump to conclusions. The problem with mediumship is it's fraught with fraud. Um, I've seen demonstrations, and I'm not going to mention any names, that to me are nothing more than charlatanism. There are um, mediums who have criminal records who are clearly researching people ahead of time. But there's always some bad apples in every barrel of apples. The <laughs> mediums that Dave works with, the ones that I associate with, are the legitimate mediums. And this is a real phenomenon. Being able to communicate with spirits is part of the human experience. And Bishop Pike was the first major theological celebrity to go public with this let's uh, take a break we'll come back we'll discuss more of the psychic world and curious case of bishop pike welcome back to the program thank you for joining us i'm dave schrader mark anthony one of our very favorite guests in the world is back with us talking about the curious case of bishop pike and we've been discussing kind of his background and in his religious upbringing now he starts bringing to the to the public the concept of mediums soothsaying, speaking, necromancing, Mark. I've got to guess that's pissing off the church leaders of the time. Absolutely. Th yeah, this, this then was the straw that broke the camel's back in the Episcopalian hierarchy, because then they wanted to get rid of Bishop Pike and Bishop Pike said, well, if you're going to do it, do it publicly and put me on trial for heresy. Okay. And it's like, whoa, a heresy trial. All right. Now, back in the medieval era, you would expect heresy. I mean, through the Renaissance, uh, Spanish Inquisition. Or the Inquisition. Is, 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 what a joke. <laughs> the Inquisition. Right. Or remember Monty Python? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> exactly. Well, nobody expected a heresy trial in the mid-20th century either. 
And then all of a sudden, the Episcopalian Church found itself in quite the dilemma. Do we take this guy who is loved by millions? He's a TV star. He's cutting edge. He stood against Joseph McCarthy, marched with Martin Luther King Jr. Do we put him on trial for heresy? And what happened is the Episcopalian Church backed off and they issued a decree that there is no heresy in the Episcopalian Church. So another one of his accomplishments, and this one I don't think he necessarily intended, but he got rid of heresy trials. What he intended was genius because you, if you take me to court, if you try to strip me of these titles legally, I get to speak out and explain my position, which is going to upset a lot of apple carts. I love watching the little documentaries because you do see his contemporaries. They're all frustrated by him, but they loved him. They respected and revered his ability to turn people into thinkers instead of just the flock of sheep. They engaged, which is what we shouldn't just be going through motions every week of, okay, it's a hymn, it's a prayer, it's a quick message, it's a hymn, it's a prayer. That's not engaging. He engaged and dragged people into thinking. And now he's he's bringing in the concept of communing with the dead. Now, is he having psychic awakenings during this himself? Yes, it was widely believed by his inner circle, particularly Diane Kennedy, his, his last wife that he himself possessed psychic ability. I don't think he necessarily conducted readings, but he was so open to it that in, in observing the phenomenon. And, you know, Dave, I, I've seen you work. And no, you're not a medium, but you can feel when spirits are around. And, and everybody can, because we all have the same basic physiology. Is some people are better at it than others. You know, and that's what I've always said. Some people are better athletes than others. Some people are better mathematicians than others. Some people are better psychics than others. It's just, just the way it works. So he really dove into this phenomenon. And it's really a shame that he died when he did. And if we can, I, I do want to talk about about his death because oh yeah of course we're gonna get into that <laughs> yeah, we, well. we gotta talk yeah. about that okay so we have this guy who's done it all in the theological sense he's had a president back him against joseph mccarthy he's been an apostate um almost tried for heresy rocked the christian world to its very foundations um, been through very difficult life, womanizing, um, a son who was probably gay, who, who took his own life, sadly. And then he decided, and he and throughout his career, he'd been to Israel several times, studying in Israel. Uh, and then he wanted to write a book about the historic Jesus. So you got to understand that while he questioned the so-called divinity of Jesus, he did not, for one instance, take away from Jesus as, as a great teacher and a mystic. In fact, um, I'm going to digress for a second, then we're going to come back to his passing. Time magazine in 1968 reviewed his book, The Other Side, the one that you have there, wherein it stated that shortly after the death of Bishop Pike's son, Jim, when Pike returned to Cambridge, strange paranormal experiences started happening. And they talk about the 819. Clocks in his apartment kept stopping at 819 the hour when James Jr. died in New York, books and cards kept toppling over to an angle that matched the hands of a clock at 819. And then Pike contacted Anna Twig, like you indicated, Dave. And during the reading, this is what came through. All right, so, so according to, to Bishop Pike, the spirit of his son came through and said, I am not in purgatory, but something like hell here which I found very interesting. Then he said, Jesus was a seer, S-E-E-R, a seer. They talk about him, they meaning the other spirits, a mystic, a seer, that he is triumphant, but they don't talk about him as a savior, but as an example. So this comes through, of course, he puts this, this in his book and, and begins to preach about this. But the Time Review went on to say that not all readers are likely to be convinced. They may ask why a bishop who has been so skeptical of received Christian tradition should be so readily to accept the assurances of assorted spiritualists that there are cats in the afterlife 
and that husbands and wives will experience a new kind of non-sexual spiritual relationship. As for the dead Jim, he appears in the book to be so vague and formless as to seem nothing more than a loving father's wish fulfillment. I can see why somebody who doesn't believe in mediumship or spirituality would say that, but it is also very apparent to me that this person has no understanding of what it is like to engage in spirit communication. Well, let me, let me say one thing. As a father, if one of my children died, the message, hey, I'm not really in purgatory. It's a lot like hell is not the message I want to hear either. So no, to say that this is was, not this is spoon feeding a grieving father what he wants to hear. That's not what you want to hear. No. But he gave he gave concepts of what life and death really are, what it means. And none of it was blasphemy, unless of course you're part of a, a larger church organization who looks down upon all of that but the fact that he's coming forward and being that honest and and giving the concept that a lot of us go through a cleansing and healing process after death that we have to go through healing we have to face the the things that we've done where there may not be a theologic hell there is that hell of realizing what it's felt like to hurt everybody that you've hurt in your life and how your your emotions affected everybody else and that could be the realism of what hell meant to jimmy bishop his son uh, yeah absolutely and that's a really good point that you brought out dave i'm not in purgatory but something like hell here you know because people always accuse mediums oh you tell people what they want to hear now speaking for myself i never say or transmit anything that isn't conveyed to me and i've had people say well i don't like what you told me it's like okay a breeding isn't about going to hear what you want to hear it is about transmitting what is conveyed to you from the spirit right and and so i you know when i read this review i pondered it for a while but when he said that oh the formless gym seems nothing more than a well spirits um you know, people expect uh, every spirit to come through and start giving, you know, their social security number. It's like, hello, I'm the spirit of Jim Jr. Here's my name, rank, serial number, social security number, and, you know, and, and all this facts and data. You got to realize we're dealing with electromagnetic energy and they're emitting these waves of frequency, which are going into the medium's brain and then getting converted into recognizable concepts based on memories, feelings, and cultural associations of the medium. All right, it would be very nice if it were, like on the show, we have a crawl going by, it'd be very nice if it were a crawl. You know, and oftentimes <laughs> we get, you know, we get some very specific information, but a lot of it, you may get um, sensations and feelings. Also, a lot of people expect everything to make sense the second it comes in. There is a process after the reading, which I call the unfolding. Think of a reading like a flower, blooms, blossoms, unfolds. It can take hours, days, weeks, years for the full meaning of a reading to make sense to somebody. And it is pretty clear to me that Bishop Pike understood that, that he studied psychic phenomenon enough to realize that it just wasn't instantaneous downloads of information because a statement like I am not in purgatory, but something like hell here, does that mean the archetypal hell with the fire and brimstone and the jerk with the pitchfork sticking in the wazoo? Or could that mean I'm on a different frequency because people that led a less volatile life? Right. You know, th there's a lot there. And Dave, you brought up a very interesting point when you said that how people of faith go through these, these quandaries you know, Mother Teresa, now when you think of Mother Teresa, you think of a more spiritual, pious person. She went through years of doubting the existence of God. If Mother Teresa can have doubts, then for those of you who are listening, who are having doubts with your belief system, you're in pretty darn good company. And I believe that, and I, and, I, and I think this is pretty clear from, from everything that I've studied about Bishop Pike. How can you have faith without doubt? It's part of the journey. Right. That's part of what faith is, right? It's yes. asking. It's 
challenging and then accepting. You know, I, I've mentioned it on the show. I'll mention it again. When you talk about God, when my mom died, I was filled with anger and rage toward God. And I had to go up and do the eulogy for my mom. And Tim took me aside because he could see the seething. And he's like, talk to me, D, what's wrong? What's going on? And I'm like, what's wrong? Dude, my mom's dead. You know, she was cheated out of this and short shaded out of that and, and ripped off of this and now this and that and the other. And he goes, Dave, you have every right to be hurt right now, man. And it's real easy to point the finger at God because we want something to blame for why we hurt so bad. Yeah, why did you do this to me? Yeah. yeah and he, yeah. Said, he said some clear things. Like one thing he said to me that really hit home was the reason it hurts so bad is because you had this gift that you no longer have. And that gift was given to you by God. Your mom was your gift and she was your biggest supporter. She was your friend. She was, she meant the world to you. He goes, but dude, look at how you're looking at things. And I could see that in reading Bishop Pike's book and Hans Holzer's book about Bishop Pike. It was taking my complaints about my mom finally retired and she was going to go travel with my dad and get to see the world. And he said, Dave, your mom traveled her whole life with your dad. She met the man of her dreams. She traveled the world with your father. She worked in a job she loved doing. And when she had to retire, her story came to an end, but she got to do everything. She saw her grandchildren, her great grandchildren. She saw your happiness. She had these moments. Dude, you got to look at what she did have and, and how full her life was. And it totally reflected back. And then it was something of, Oh man, it is. It's how you look at a situation and coming from somebody who deals with depression and anxiety. It's real easy to say, yeah, yeah. Just don't feel that way. Yeah. That, that, that never works, Mark. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's not yeah, what. Tim just, said. Yeah, just stop being depressed, you know. But that's not what Tim said. He said it's yeah. he goes, You're you're looking at this head on at the problem right now. Now come out and look from this angle and realize, man, your mom got to do this. Your mom got to see all these things. Your mom lived long enough to see you do the show and and get to do radio and meet all these paranormal people and all the things that she accomplished through you. And, and it's, it was like, wow. So I could see in, in Bishop Pike's world as well as he's making these connections, how that's rewiring the concepts we've all been trained to believe or conceive. Now there's much more to it. And he starts having quite profound experiences with the dead and with yes. the, the thought of what life and death really means. Right. And so after all this comes out and he gets basically even though he didn't get charged with heresy, heresy, they pulled the, the rug out from under him. And for somebody with as dynamic, controversial, and public a career, his death was almost fitting. He and Diane went to Israel because he wanted to follow in the footsteps of the historic Jesus. So they drove out, they, they flew into uh, to, uh, Tel Aviv, they rented a car. Now, this is what I don't understand. They only bought two Cokes and they drove off into the Judean desert. Okay, and I've been in a lot of deserts. I've been in deserts uh, in Asia and in uh, the United States and actually in the areas in the Pacific. They're hot, okay, that's why they call them deserts. Well, their car got stuck in some sand and, or they had a map, but they didn't know where they were. This was years before GPS, they didn't even have a compass. And so they started leaving, looking for water. They found a shady spot, but he was not in great health, big time chain smoker. So Diane left him there to go for help. Eventually she found it. When they returned to the shady spot, he was nowhere to be found. His body was found some days later. It apparently he'd wandered off and, and he did find a water source, but then left some clothes there so they could track him but his body was found in a ravine. It appeared that he was climbing up a canyon wall and then plunged to his death. Interestingly enough, his body was in a kneeling position when they found him. So he died in the Judean desert, searching for the historical Jesus. Maybe this is tragedy, or maybe this really was the dynamic end to a dynamic life. Can the True Crime Tuesday aspect of my brain kick in for a minute here? Absolutely. Because when I started reading this, I'm like, hmm, the wife survives and then he's found dead long after. Is there any chance there was foul play? They had to look into that at some point, didn't they, Mark? Uh, they absolutely did. But, you know, it doesn't appear that way because from all accounts, they really did love each other. 
And you got to realize, too, she was 24 years younger than him, but then maybe she wanted to get rid of him. But he was only 56 when he died. I know, but I'm only 53, and my wife's almost 40, and I'm pretty sure she's still trying to figure out ways to get me to go up a mountain cliff with her. <laughs> if you ever see me posting on Instagram that I'm out having a walk on a mountainside, Mark, send a helicopter because she's going to shove me off. She's going to shove you off. Yeah, you know, Dave, <laughs> I have to say the suspicious lawyer in me started thinking about that too because it was just a little bit too much. But if, if she did try to kill him, but why would they just go into the Judean desert with two cans of Coke? I mean, I've been in, I, like I said, I've been in some deserts and you better have water and something to create shade and have a backup plan. I mean, it's it's miserable. I mean, it's interesting and all that, but it, it is absolutely miserable. So, yeah, I always wondered about that too, but it doesn't appear to be the case. On the other hand, we must always keep an open mind. That's right. Not a, and again, I don't mean to take it to a, a nefarious place, but it's the question. <laughs> right? You got when you're out. Anytime a husband and wife go out together, and one is older, and then suddenly missing, uh, mm -hmm. and then they find him dead, but the wife makes it. I, you you got to ask some questions, and it would be the same if it was the other way around. And one of the things he was going out in hopes of finding the cave that Jesus went to when he kind of squared off with the devil. Right. Right. He yeah. wanted to he wanted to fight his challenges and 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 kind of face these aspects as well. So you're right. Did he find the historical Christ? Did he find it in those moments? And there he is in the kneeling supine position of prayer in death. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. But his story physically ends there. They bury him in Israel. Right. But yeah. but that's not the end of his soul tale, is it? No, I mean, his legacy lives on. I mean, and his wife, Diane, is is an ordained uh, priest in the Episcopal religion. She's still going strong. She'd be a fascinating person to to interview. I don't know if she grants interviews anymore, but... Uh, well, she might have before I started asking if she killed him. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something cool. If you do find the book online, the, the Psychic World of Bishop Pike by Hans Holzer, it says, in a Dramatic confrontation, the author makes contact with the spirit of the bishop himself through the trans mediumship of the eminent medium, Ethel Johnson Myers, who you've seen featured on Holzer Files with us, folks. The psychic world of Bishop Pike is a unique account that only the author could have written, for he knows intimately both Bishop Pike's world and the psychic world as well. Hans Holzer had also worked with Bishop Pike in making a documentary film about the bishop's parapsychological experiences. You know, it was pretty interesting that, that they do come through and that that she finds a way to communicate, or, or I should say, he finds a way to communicate through this medium and goes through Ethel and again, gives some pretty compelling communication to Dr. Holzer, which is outlined in the book and others enough to make them believe that they truly did come into contact with Bishop Pike and that, you know, they, they too get some answers to what the other side is all about. Certainly. And, and somebody like Bishop Pike, his spirit would definitely want to be illuminating our understanding of the afterlife. I think his story, like all of our stories, it does not end a physical death. You know, we have to realize we're only living in the material world for now. And, you know, Dave, I want to revisit something when you're talking about your mom. And I know how close you guys were. Mm -hmm. We grieve as deeply as we have loved. And that's why you grieved so heavily because your love, the love for your mother could fill the Pacific Ocean and then some. But we also have to realize that grief is the price of love. But on the other hand, a life without love is not much of a life at all. And that's part of the human experience and living in the material world. And thank you, Madonna, for that last line. We appreciate it. Actually, I got it from George, George Harrison. And George Harrison actually uh, managed Madonna for a period, and he right. produced that movie that she was in with Sean Penn. But where George Harrison got the term living in the material world comes from Hinduism. Right. Which I've been studying since actually I was a child. You know, you just so. stick with that, Mark. We all know that on that other wall over there, you've got Madonna's <laughs> like a prayer poster hanging up still. You don't you can't fool me. You know, when you do a deeper dive into Bishop Pike like this and you find somebody like this who is so forward thinking, even back in the 60s, Mark, and what does that what does that say to you today in the 21st century about what we're really capable of? 
Well, the the possibilities are endless. You know, what what I love about Bishop Pike, it, it was very clear that he was a genius. And he was disliked in the Episcopalian Church. There's a lot of jealousy there, too. He got all the attention. Uh, he wrote the controversial books. He had the TV show. And just because people are members of the clergy doesn't mean they're not backstabbing, manipulative, and hateful. And that's one of the hardest things that he had a hard time comprehending was how spiteful his fellow members of the clergy were. But despite that, that his thirst for knowledge and the quest for understanding, what it says to us in the 21st century is that the quest is continuing. Our technology is better now. Also, mediumship has come out of the, the fringe element and is being discussed openly. And I think that that's really positive. You know, when he said things that, you know, about James Randi, you know, he created, uh, what do they call it in Star Trek, the Kobayashi Maru, his million dollar right. challenge. Um, I had uh, some some mathematicians analyze it and they said there, it's impossible to win this because he was judge, jury and executioner. OK, so no matter what evidence or whatever you presented, he was the one that decided, no, you don't get the million dollars. It's kind of like the Greek myth of uh uh, Tantalus, you know, he's in Hades, he tries to reach for the food and it gets too high or tries to drink the water and it vanishes. No matter what, you're never going to be satisfied there. So there's always going to be people like that. What he did with Peter Popoff, though, Popoff definitely deserved it. First off, he was not a psychic. He was a phony religious fanatic and his wife was backstage broadcasting to him. He had an earpiece in and one of Randy's people they started scanning the lower um, bands of AM radio and they caught it. And she'd be like, lady in the third row, fifth from their left. Um, she had a tumor, you know, because people had to fill out. They had to fill out a questionnaire before they go in about all their ailments and things. They give it to his wife. Then she's backstage transmitting it to him. So if you ever go see a medium or an evangelist and they make you fill out a questionnaire, <laughs> about what's wrong with you. And then all of a sudden the guy, oh, you know, that's when, that's when you take this very skeptically. Agreed. Uh, the very curious case of Bishop Pike, I recommend getting the book, go online, watch some of the, the videos. Um, the, they're pretty compelling. And, and I think there's even just one of him talking for about an hour and a half about these concepts and beliefs and, and challenging the church paradigm. Again, never in a disrespectful manner, but wanting us to stop following blindly what religion should really be is forgiving, loving, all inclusive. And, you know, obviously I'm not talking about murderers and child rapists and things right. like that. So I, I can already tell I'll get some emails. Well, what about these people? Are they okay? How about the ones <laughs> making love to sheep? Should that be okay? No, obviously, you know that, but I'm just saying. Oh, you get those emails too, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's about inclusivity and loving one another. It's like the people that beat up other people in this paranormal field. You know what? We're all in it for the same deal. We all want to have an experience to understand what is out there above and beyond the reality that we have here. Coming together is how we break those paradigms and start to learn together by everybody hoarding their little ball of knowledge, thinking theirs is the right one instead of sharing it and seeing how it might create something even more powerful. Mark, talk to me a little bit. Of, I know you got to get going, but what's what's going on with you? I know you've got the new book, uh, Afterlife Frequency. Can you give us a little taste? What does that mean? The Afterlife Frequency for thousands of years, people have reported contact with spirits either through a medium maybe a visitation in a dream near-death experiences deathbed visions and they all occur when the energetic vibration of the human soul touches the higher energy of the afterlife frequency and this book is a riveting adventure into the afterlife that takes you around the globe and from the cosmic to the subatomic and i've spent five years uh writing this and probably at least 10 years researching it and uh, so far it's been endorsed by 10 of the top near-death experience and afterlife researchers in the world and please sign up for my newsletter when you go to my website afterlifefrequency.com my radio show 
uh, The Psychic in the Dock every Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And uh, I've got a lot of events, so you can find out about it and booking a reading with me at afterlifefrequency.com. Tell people about your, your uh, podcast so people know a little bit about what The Psychic in the Dock is. Yeah, the psychic and well, the it's doctor. It's not just them thinking you're sitting on the dock of the bay, just a medium watching yeah, the tide um, roll away. My, my co-host is Dr. Pat Basili, and she founded the Transformation Network about, I don't know, if it go. She's the host of the award-winning The Dr. Pat Show. It's about uh, 40, I think 40 or more shows on Transformation Network. And the psychic and the doc, uh, all subjects are on the table. No topic is taboo. We have fascinating guests. And the show is live, and, and we where people call in, and I'll do a mini reading. And then Dr. Pat adds her intuitive, street smart spiritualism. And she is a behavioral psychologist, world renowned, has a degree from Columbia. She's hilarious. We have such a great time on, on this show. And uh, that's the Psychic in the Dock every Thursday. You can find out more about it at afterlifefrequency.com. Remember, you can check me out at all the different events I'll be a part of this year by going to darknessevents.com. So uh, that's that's that. Thank you very much for tuning in, spending a little bit more time with us, Mark. Thanks for the great research and the information on uh, Bishop Pike. Thank you, Dave. It's great. And hey, Army of Darkness, keep tuning in. And uh, thank you, Dave, for having me on the show. It's always uh, a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Here on, on on YouTube, folks, subscribe. It's free. Hit the little bell so that you never miss any of the new uh, content that we put out. And uh, feel free to make comments below, and I will do my best to answer any questions there. Mm -hmm.